So we're in 1 Samuel, and uh, the book is, you know, if you remember, basically broken into the, the three parts, the lives of these three men, Samuel, Saul, and David, and we've kind of crossed over from, uh, we had Samuel's life in the first section, then we, we saw Saul, his uh, coming into being king, and then his falling from grace, so to speak, falling from favor, and David being uh, anointed, uh, chosen as the new king, David slaying Goliath, and, and now we see a little bit more about his relationship with Jonathan, Saul's son, Jonathan. If you remember, David is now being uh, hunted, is now being hunted by Saul. Although David's only blessed Saul, he's never done anything to undermine him, never done anything to undercut him. Uh, Saul is extremely intimidated by David, by his faith, by his courage, and Saul has decided to make David public enemy number one. Jonathan, in chapter 19, tried to reconcile his best friend with his dad, and it's just not happening. Saul, you can't trust what this guy says. As I said in my teaser I sent out, he says what he needs to say, but then he does what he wants to do. And that's sort of the life of Saul. Chapter 20 really highlights this relationship between Jonathan and David. I don't know how you do in the area of friendship. How you doing in the area of friendship? I feel like you're, you know, if you had to rate yourself on a scale of one to 10, I'm not talking for a quantity of Facebook friends. That's not what we're talking about. Uh, I'm talking about real friendship. Who is it in your life that if you were in the hospital, you know that you know that you know that they would be there for you? And who is it that if they're in the hospital, you know that you know that you're going to be there for them. Who is it that when they get the bad news, they're going to call you in tears, and you're going to say, I'll be right over. I'll drop anything that's going on to be there for you. That's what I call friendship. How are you doing? Do you have those people in your life? I mean, I think all of the, the statistics show that it's an area, friendship skills are an area where Americans are really stumbling in our day and age. Loneliness on the rise, uh, suicide, things like that on the rise. But loneliness, this is a, a huge health uh, risk in, li in life. This is a huge health dilemma for our country. And I mentioned a while ago, England hired someone for their a ministry of loneliness to deal with the problem. It's a public health problem, loneliness. We have all of these social media venues, all of these avenues for superficial relationships that don't cost me anything. I can have tons of relationships where I receive something and I tell other people what I think. But when it comes to actually a relationship where there's a give and a take or a, a blessing and a receiving, I, I don't think we do so good because we're so fast to cut and run, aren't we? I mean, that's been my experience. If, it, if a relationship gets difficult, well, I'm out. Or I've been hurt before. I don't want to get hurt again. So I can't get close to anybody because it's just too risky. I can't risk being hurt again. And so we suffer alone out of fear or anxiety or distrust or whatever the case might be. And so, and, and I'm going to highlight, I think this chapter highlights relationships, friendships among men. Oh, I mean, women, you know, you got your own issues, <laughs> but uh, you tend to seek after relationship. Men tend to isolate. And so we see in this chapter this wonderful close relationship. Uh, matter of fact, it's so close between Jonathan and David that some have suggested that they were homosexual. And I couldn't say anything would be farther from the truth, but isn't it interesting that the minute we see two men have a close friendship, we automatically, oh, they must be having sex. And it's just, a, that's why, what says you need to be a close, to, 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 be, to have that kind of relationship. Can't you just be close friends? Isn't that possible? So watch what happens as David uh, and, and Jonathan work out. Uh, it's a tough chapter for Jonathan. I mean, he's stuck in the middle. On one side, he's got his relationship with his father. On the other side, he's got his relationship with David. And it's quite a, a sticky chapter uh, for, for Jonathan and for David and for Saul as well. So verse 1 begins with, uh, Then David fled from Naoth and Ramah and went and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity? And what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? Now, if you remember, David, J Jonathan had tried to sort out this relationship. David, uh, Saul, excuse me, Saul had said, hey, 
uh, I'm going to kill Jonathan. I, we're, John, John, uh, hold on a second. Too many names here. I'm going to kill David, and I need Jonathan and, and you others around me. We're going to all make David public enemy number one. And Jonathan speaks to his father says, hey, Dad, come on, you know, lighten up. What's he done to you? He's just done nothing but good for you. And, and Saul says, okay, this is back in chapter 19, uh, verse 6. So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he, David, shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as at times past. So it seems that Jonathan has reconciled this relationship, but man, you know, Saul doesn't act on integrity. What does he act on? Emotion. So the minute Saul's emotions get roaring again, he's pitching spears at David, trying to kill him again. So David has to get lowered out of his wife's roof. Remember that? She puts the, the goat hair in the bed and tricks Saul's servants. And Anyway, so he's on the run. And now he runs. Uh, as Saul's chasing him down, he runs back to Jonathan and says, Jonathan, what's the deal with your dad? I mean, what have I done? What's my iniquity? What's my sin before your father that he seeks my life? I like that. And I think it's a true mark of a friendship when you can say to your friend, what have I done? It doesn't, doesn't friendship, doesn't a sustained, lasting, committed friendship involve sometimes you saying to your friend, what have I done? I mean, look into my life. Do you, what, what sin have I committed? Do you see something? Do you see anything that's going on? And so I think that's one of the first things I learned about friendship here is that friendship demands honesty, real friendship. The Bible says faithful are the wounds of a what? Of a friend. Your real friends will tell you the truth. Your fake friends will tell you, oh, no problem, nothing to worry about, everything's okay. But your real friends will tell you, here's the deal, here's what I see. And, and you need people in your life that are gonna do that. So a little bit about Jonathan and, and David. Go back a little bit, chapter 14. Jonathan is this kind of guy, I mean, he's just passionate for the Lord. Remember, he attacks the garrison of the Philistines. He's like, look, to his armor bearer, he says, Let's go over, you know, who knows? I mean, it's only two of us, but man, God doesn't need a lot of people. He can do a lot with a little. So let's go and see what the Lord can do with us. And don't, I just love that heart. That's the heart of courage and the heart of faith in Jonathan. So we've got that. And then Jonathan is there at the battle when they're standing off with Goliath and the Philistines, and he's one that, that won't go and face Goliath. So he's got faith, but not that much faith. And he watches as the shepherd boy grabs his sling and runs at the Goliath Philistine, the giant, and just lets that thing go and knocks him out. And he's watching with eyes like saucers going, now that's the kind of guy I want to be around. That, a guy with that kind of faith, I need to know who this guy is. So they, after the battle, you know, David is carrying Goliath's head. I mean, this is kind of nasty. So <laughs> but Saul calls him, who is that kid? You know, who is, let me, I'm going to talk to him. So he begins uh, this conversation with Saul, and De uh, Jonathan is listening to this. And as soon as he's done talking to Saul, it's, it says in chapter 18, verse 1, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Now, we picture them in our minds as being at the same age, Right? But do you know there's probably, it depends on the estimate you read, probably about a 27-year age difference. David being 27 years younger. David becomes king when he's 30. Jonathan dies in battle at age 57. You do the math. And that, that, that kind of changes, reframes this relationship, doesn't it? And as I was thinking about that, I mean, I've got some guys in this church that I've walked with for many years. We've served the Lord together, some sitting in this room, that I would say, these are my battle buddies. These are close friends. We've prayed together. We've walked together. We've cried together. We've enjoyed ministry together. But then I have some guys in my life, I can think of one in particular, who is probably 25 years older than I am. And I remember some of our early conversations when, when he just started serving the Lord here through this church. And... I remember this very conversation about, I don't want to just show up at church and just go through the motions. He says, I'm interested in friendship. And he was interested in, in friendship. And for us serving together, 
uh, but being friends, this kind of relationship. And you know, to this day, 14 years later, we have developed over time this kind of relationship. He is a father in the faith to me. He's 25 years my elder. But interestingly, too, that David was the younger and Jonathan was the older. Jonathan was the heir to the throne. It was Jonathan that should have been jealous of this young guy because Jonathan was set to be the king. But Jonathan never cared about his own place, his own power, his own deal. He was courageous enough and secure enough and had faith enough to know that God was working through this younger man and willing to and able to support him. Their friendship was built on a mutual faith and a support for what God was doing in each other's lives. And, and it is, it's just been such a beautiful part of my life. And I look at, at some of the young guys in this church that, that I hope I want to see as God is working in their lives, that I can come alongside of them and say, you know what, I hope that whatever measure of faith God has given me, I hope that it, it, he doubles it in your life. And whatever I can do to support and encourage you in your calling. So do you have the, I mean, these things develop not by chance. These things develop through just serving the Lord, being involved in the body of Christ, at the work of God. And all of a sudden you look next to you and you're like, wow, I've got, I've got friends now. I've got people I'm serving with. We're battling together. We're praying together. We're walking together. We're ministering together. And that is kind of how it goes with David and Jonathan. When Jonathan dies in battle, 2 Samuel 126 records that David lamented when Jonathan died, and he said at that time that his love for Jonathan was more wonderful than the love of a woman. Now, he was married to Michael, Saul's daughter, so we can understand his perspective a little bit. But this relation, there's a relationship that two men can have. And this, this brotherly love, this battle buddy kind of relationship that is just different than a relationship a man will have with his wife. Two different kinds of loves, and both important and both valuable. I value my wife's love like you would never believe. Couldn't, I, don't, I couldn't live without that. But I also value the relationship of some of the other men in the church. And so my encouragement to the guys here is, I hope that someday you'll know this kind of relation, this kind of love with another man because you've served with them, you've shared this like passion for God. That's what's at the bottom of this. Jonathan watches David run on the battlefield and says, man, that guy has a soul like my soul. I, I know what makes him tick because that's what makes me tick too. And I love it. I love it. So we're not getting very far, are we, church? <laughs> what, is, what is my iniquity? What is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And Jonathan said to him, by, by no means, you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It's not so. Hey, he, he seeks your life? No, he, no, he doesn't seek you. What do you mean, my dad seeking your life? No, no, we sorted that out. We got that worked out. If, if my dad wanted to seek your life, I mean, he would have told me. But Jonathan is going to start to learn some hard lessons about his dad. So David took an oath again. Remember, their relationship is a covenant relationship. It means that, let me give you the long-term vision. What they have sorted out is that David is going to be the next king. Jonathan sees it in him. David knows it. And Jonathan says, look, I am going to support you, protect you, be by your side. And when you are serving as king, I'm going to be right there with you, battling for you, uh, fighting for you, praying with you. I'm with you. And that's the relationship, that the covenant loyalty that they have with one another. And that's why he says, David took an oath again and said, your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. This is verse three. And he said, do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Jonathan, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Now, remember, David's the younger man, but in some ways, a little bit wiser, says, look, your dad hadn't told you because he knows how much you care about me. That's why your dad has kept this from you. But I'm telling you, you got to trust me when I tell you there is but a step between me and death. I mean, I am just one step away from death. Your dad is trying to kill me. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? There is just a step. There's but a step between me and death. 
And it, it's always that way, isn't it? There's just a, there's but a step between me and death. We have this distorted view that we've got all this time. I'll get to it next year. I'll do it tomorrow. Do it today. Make that call. Mend that relationship. Serve the Lord. Don't wait till the dog dies and the kids are in college, right? I mean, so because some parents say, well, I'm gonna, I've got, I mean, busy with life and I'm raising kids and I look, I look around our church. Let me just be honest with you for a minute, as if I wasn't being honest just before. You gotta watch when the pastor says, let me be honest with you. <laughs> but I look around the church. We've got some wonderful guys serving the Lord and ministry in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And we've got some passionate young guys and girls serving the Lord in their teens and 20s. But I see a huge void in the 30-year-old range. Now, I started serving the Lord more actively when I was in my late 20s and all through my 30s. I, I, was, I forget how old when, I was started, when we started this church, but it was in my 30s. I mean, I'm only 40 now. Let me be honest with you. <laughs> but I just don't see the 30-something guys going, I'm in, I want to serve the Lord. I see the 20-somethings, and I see the 40, 50, 60-somethings, but I'm just not seeing it, you know. So we say, oh, I'll, I'll get around to it later, but there's just a step. There's a step. Who knows what step that is? Step between me and death. And so uh, David says this to Jonathan, verse 4. So Jonathan said to David, whatever you yourself desire, I will do it for you. And friendship includes service. Wait, look, you put yourself aside, you know, to, to have a friend, one must first be found friendly. That's what the Proverbs tell us. You, people say, well, I want more friendships. Well, be friendlier. Then you'll have, if you love people, you'll have as many friends as you could ever want. Because people love to be loved. So if you love them, if you forget about yourself, instead of you wanting more friends and trying to get more friends and bribing people and manipulating people to be your friend, if you just lay it down and say, I'm just going to love people. I'm just going to serve people. You'll have all the friends you could ever want. And friendship require, requires dying to yourself. Look, this is how husbands and wives become friends. Isn't that great when a husband and a wife are actually friends too? Isn't that great? Because you lay down your life. You don't get into relationship because of what you get from it. That's a byproduct. You get into relationship because what you give to it. And so this is what Jonathan says. Look, whatever you yourself desire, I'll do it for you. Jonathan could have been jealous, but he's not. Verse 5, and David said to Jonathan, indeed, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king to eat. So they're going to have a, a festival, new moon festival. It's going to last a couple of days. And David is invited, and Jonathan's invited. The whole family's going to be there. And David, of course, was serving, had been serving Saul in his court and his private musician and all that. So I'm not going to fail to sit there with the king to eat, but let me go that I may hide in the field until the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, in other words, if he looks around the table and goes, hey, where, where's David? Then say, well, David earnestly asked permission of me that he might run over to Bethlehem, his city, for there's a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he says thus, it is well, yeah, it's okay. Your servant will be safe. But if he is very angry, be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore, you shall deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. Nevertheless, if there is iniquity in me, kill me yourself, for why should you bring me to your father? So they're kind of plotting what to do. Look, Jonathan says, well, how can, you know, my dad's not going to kill you. He told me he wasn't going to kill you. And David says, ah, don't be so naive, Jonathan. And here's how we're going to know. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go and hide. Your dad's going to invite me to this new moon festival, but I'm going to go and hide out in the woods. And if your dad notices my absence and he says, hey, where's David? You say, oh, he had to run over to Bethlehem. Just lie to your dad. I mean, he lies to you all the time. Lie to him. I'm not sure that's the best idea, but this is, they're trying to understand uh, and trying to get Jonathan to understand where Saul really is. So here's how they're going to do it. If he says, oh, he's, he went home to Bethlehem, oh, no problem. No problem. We'll, we'll just catch him 
the next new moon feast. He would just take it like no big deal. But if he gets angry, if when I'm not there, he's angry, then you'll know that he wants to kill me. And so that's kind of the the way that they're going to sort this out. But notice verse 8. He says, therefore, you shall deal kindly with your servant because or for you have brought your servant into the covenant of the Lord with you. So that deal kindly, that's the Hebrew chesed. We talked about that a lot back in the book of Ruth, Ruth and Boaz, this, this loyal kindness. It's the kindness of God. It's that loyal, unconditional kindness. And he says, this is part of this relationship that we have. Nevertheless, if there's iniquity in me, kill me yourself. Don't bring me to your father. And part of, part of friendship is kindness. Isn't that, wouldn't that, doesn't that seem to go without saying that part of friendship is kindness? Those are the people in your life. You know, you can't be kind. Uh, well, you can be kind to everybody, but you know that special kind of relationship. I can't have that kind of friendship with 100 guys. I just can't. And we don't have that much relational energy or capacity. You're going to have a capacity in your life for a certain number of close friendships. Then you'll have some, you know, some friendships. Then you'll have some acquaintances. And it's important to know in your life which are which. And they're, because they're going to involve different amounts of energy and time and, and so forth. And, and one of those levels, that, that inner level of relationship, that committed loyalty and kindness demands uh, kindness. Someone that you get an extra special present for. Someone that you just, you go out of your way for. And that's the kind of relationship Jonathan and David had. And this is going to extend on down to the generations, and you'll see that in a minute. Verse 9, but Jonathan said, far be it from you, for if I knew certainly that evil was determined by my father to come upon you, then I would, uh, would I not tell you? Then David said to Jonathan, who will tell me? What if, uh, or what if your father answers you roughly? So in other words, as we're, we're figuring this out, I mean, how am I going to know? I'm hiding in the woods. You can't just text me and say, hey, dad's cool. Come on home. You can't text that. So how are we going to communicate? And by the way, this also should go without saying uh, friendship involves healthy communication, good communication, and, and an ongoing communication. We're going to have to communicate with each other. Again, these seem like simple relationship skills, but sometimes you got to put down the text, put down the, the Facebook, and just go have lunch. There's got to be not just Facebook, but there's got to be face-to-face time to cultivate a real relationship. How many of you know texting does not do it? You cannot have a real friendship if all you do is text. There's got to be something else. But the young people believe that they can have deep relationships through texting because that's what they know. But texting, come on, somebody, it, it falls way short, doesn't it? It just falls way short. So they're going to they're gonna have to have this communication about what's happening uh, with the situation that, that Jonathan has joined David in. So verse 11, Jonathan said to David, come, let us go out into the field. So both of them went out into the field. And Jonathan said to David, the Lord God of Israel is witness. When I have sounded out my father sometime tomorrow, when I've checked out dad, see, see where he is, or the third day, and indeed there is good toward David, and I do not send and tell, to you and tell you, may the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. So it, he's using kind of the first person uh, kind of uh, language, or maybe that's that the third person maybe? I don't know what person that is. They're talking, using their own names. But Jonathan says, look, if I go, if, if I find out my dad is cool and I don't come to tell you, then they might have used a hand signal like this, like, so be it to me, you know, I'm done. If I don't come and tell you, in other words, I swear I'll come and tell you if it's good with dad. But if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I'll report it to you and send you away that you may go in safety. And the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. So Jonathan knows David is going to be the king. And you shall not only show me the kindness, there it is again, of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die. See, it would have been a common practice for a monarchy, man, anybody else who is, once David becomes king, you would want to wipe out anybody who could possibly vie for the throne. Jonathan would have been able to make a power play 
Saul's family versus David's family, Bethlehem versus Judah. And, 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 but he says, look, if, if I do this for you, I mean, this is part of our relationship, part of our covenant, is that you will, I'm, I'm putting myself at risk for you. I mean, he's going against his dad. He's going against the kid. You see, how, by the way, do you know that friendship takes risk? And sometimes friendship involves putting yourself in a risky situation for your friend. Sometimes it involves entering into their yuck uh, for, and what they're involved in. And that can be really, really difficult and challenging. And because of his loyalty to Jonathan and to lo- Jonathan's loyalty to David, Jonathan says, look, you know, I'm going out on a limb for you. And here's all I ask of you, that when you're the king, while you're still alive, that you show me kindness. That I may not, don't kill me, but you shall not cut off your kindness, verse 15, verse 15 from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. Now that's gonna come in real handy to know. Remember that, underline it, highlight it, because we're gonna read about a really cool guy named, anybody know, Jonathan's son, 2 Samuel, Mephibosheth. David is gonna become king, And he's going to say, hey, is there anybody left from the family of Saul that I can show kindness to because of my relationship with Jonathan? Now, by that time, Jonathan's already dead. Saul's already dead. Now, this young son of Jonathan named Mephibosheth, not only is he crippled, but he also could potentially make a run for the throne. And and at that point, David says, hey, is there anybody left that I can show kindness to? I remember this covenant I made. What What a man of integrity this point in his life at least. Is there anybody left? Because I made a promise to Jonathan and now he's got an orphan son and I want to make good on my promise. Don't you appreciate people in your life that'll make good on their promises? That's what friends do. Friends make good on their promises. I love that. His dad is killed in battle. He's lame and David invites him to eat at his table forever. I'm going to care for him. I'm going to care for him forever. So this will, that's where this begins right here. Now, Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Then Jonathan said to David, tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. And when you have stayed three days, go down quickly and come to the place where you hid on the day of the deed and remain by the stone of Etzel. Then I will shoot three arrows to the side as though I shot at the target. This is how they're going to communicate. And there I will send a lad, a little guy, saying, go find the arrows. If I expressly say to the lad, look, the arrows are on this side of you. Get them and come. Then as the Lord lives, there is safety for you and no harm. So David, okay, I'm writing this down. Okay, if it's this way, then safety. Okay, got to make sure I got this straight. But if I say thus to the young man, Look, arrows are behind you. Go your way, for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter which you and I have spoken of, indeed, the Lord be between you and me forever. So this is a covenant God will make sure. We're we're making this covenant in the the eyes of God. He will make sure we keep our, our promises to one another. So they have the communication system set. Verse 24, then David hid in the field, just as they had planned, And when the new moon had come, the king sat down to eat the feast. Now the king sat on his seat, as at other times, on a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side. Saul's got all his peeps there, all his family, all his, his leaders. But David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul didn't say anything that day, for he thought, well, something has happened to him. Maybe he's unclean, meaning that he's He's got into some ritual impurity. He can't come to the feast because he's got to wait 24 hours. He'll be out tomorrow night. Maybe something's happened to him. He's unclean. Surely that's got to be it. Saul's convincing himself. That's, that's why he's not here. And it happened the next day, the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, why has the son of Jesse not come to eat either yesterday or today? As if he's real worried about David and, and David's well-being. So here, their plan is working perfectly. He asks about David's uh, presence, and Jonathan knows what to say. Remember what he's going to say? All right, let's see. He went off to Bethlehem, right? Jonathan answered, Saul, oh, David asked permission of me 
to go to Bethlehem. And he said, please let me go, for our family has a sacrifice in the city, and my brother has commanded me to be there. I mean, it's a family obligation. What could I do? And now, if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore, he has not come to the king's table. So in other words, Jonathan said, yeah, sure, David, go ahead. I mean, none of this is really happening. David's hiding in the woods. But this is what they're telling Saul to get a, a sounding on it, to get a measure as to where is this guy. And Jonathan's going to be really disappointed when he finds out. So the question is now, how will Saul respond? How do you think he responds? Think he's going to be, ah, oh, no problem, I understand. No, no, no. Then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan. And he said to him, watch out now. Yeah, this is rated M for mature. He said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. That's his wife he's talking about. Now, I can't translate that because this is live streaming on the radio. I can't repeat the vulgarity that Saul just uttered. But it's you son of a, and you can fill in the blank, for what might be said. Basically, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. That's what he says. But it's, you know, you, you can read it in the Message Bible. You can read it in, uh, I think, the, the today's English version has a very interesting translation of this. But uh, trust me, it is vulgar. You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse? Doesn't even call him by his name. You have chosen the son of Jesse, to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness. In other words, your mother gave birth to you. How dare. Does this sound like some of your families? Is this what Christmas dinner was like at your place? <laughs> this, is, this is horrible. Yeah, this is a shame. This is a brought shame on your mother. So Saul is so manipulative. And he's so connected David with uh, Jonathan now. Jonathan with David that he says, you are just a shame. Shame to your mother. It's been very Middle East. This is shame-based culture, too. For as long as the son of Jesse lives on earth, that son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established, nor your kingdom. Saul says, Jonathan, what are you thinking? You are walking away from your kingdom. Get your wits about you, man. You're giving it all up. For what? For the shepherd boy? For this nobody? For this traitor? So he, they knew. Jonathan knew what it was going to cost him to support David. And his father, is dad given good advice or not? Dad's advice is, son, go for the power. Who cares about people? Anybody grow up with advice like that? Who cares about people? Get everything you can all the time you can. Every time you can. It's about power. It's about money. It's about position. Man, don't, don't we love to watch those videos? You see these videos where these kids are running a race, these little kids, and they're all running a race, and this one kid trips on the track and starts to cry, and the other kids stop in their tracks, and they all walk back, and they pick them up, and then they all cross the finish line together, and we all go, oh, we start crying past the tissues, and they start crying, because it touches something deep in us. But some of the fathers are like, no, don't go back there. Cross the finish line. Get your medal. You know, go, go finish, and then go back and see if he's okay. Now, this is, this is parents on the ball field, worrying about the score and the kid's success. They've got him already slotted for the pros. He's six, six years old. I mean, knock it off. You're teaching horrible relationship skills. And so, but this is what's on Saul's mind. Jonathan's got a whole, Jonathan cares more about his relationship with David than he does his, does his powers. He is willing to take a, it is better to take a second seat and serving David than to have his own throne. And that's what it takes to be a friend. That's what it takes to be a real friend. You gotta be willing to let someone else sit on the throne and to just serve them. See, because the, the manipulative friendship says, I wanna be on the throne. And all the people around me have to serve me and my needs. That means I'm the king, I'm on the throne. But to be a friend and to be friendly, you have to let other people be on the throne. And that's the difference. No jealousy. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, oh, and said to him, why should he be killed? What has he done, dad? Knock it off. 
You're embarrassing. It's a shame the way you think. It's horrible. What have you become, Dad? How, why should he be killed? What's he done to you? What's he done to bring this on? And Saul could give him an answer here. It wouldn't be a good one, I'm sure, but he gives him an answer. What's he do? Verse 33, then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him. Now he's trying to kill his own son. Talk about, you know, festival gone bad. Jonathan, and, and so Jonathan knew. Good thing Saul has bad aim. That's because he throws a spear at David and he missed. And now he throws it at Jonathan. Just in anger. Did you grow up like that? Did you grow up never knowing when dad was going to fly off the handle? When he's just going to throw something at you, get the belt out, never, never predictable, just emotional? You got to recover from that stuff. You got to realize that your father in heaven is not that way. Very predictable. God is immutable. He never flies off an emotional tangent, decides to punish you just because he's in a bad mood. Praise God is right. We got a whole different kind of family, the family of God. Whole different kind of father. And so Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger. That is, uh, one translator said, that, is, that type of, the wording used there is the height of, of disappointed human fury. When Jonathan gets up from that table, what must be going on in his own emotional mind? He gets up in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David. So we know one thing that's on his mind is that he is just grieved over the fact that his dad is trying to kill his best friend, this young man that he has this love relationship with, this kindred spirit. And I'm sure, I can only imagine this, Jonathan storms out that he's also disappointed in what his dad has become. And I don't know what kind of father figure you had in, in your home. His dad has just cursed him out and tried to kill him, told him he's a shame, shameful behavior. And it's not the son's fault. It's dad who's off kilter. Sometimes that happens in life, doesn't it? And you begin, you've lived your whole life believing those lies that your dad told you. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never be anything. You'll never, you will be worth, you're worthless. You might as well have never been born. I know people that they've been told, some of you have been told that. And you live with those thoughts playing over and over in your mind. And then you bring those into your church experience and you go, well, God, I'll never do anything for the Lord. God, God couldn't use me. I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. And then God tells you, but I love you. And you don't even know what that is. You don't know where to start with that. It's completely foreign to your experience. So he gets up and, and now he's got to deal with the disappointment about his own father. And the next night, the table is real quiet, isn't it? There's Jonathan's seat and it's empty. And there's David's seat and it's empty. And I'll bet you could hear a pin drop in that room as people ate their dinner, going, oh, I ain't saying nothing, you know. I saw the way he threw that spear. No. But the type of behavior that Jonathan and David had, the type of relationship that Jonathan and David have, that, that fosters unity and oneness and love. The type of man that Saul is, selfish, narcissistic, people pleaser, you end up with an empty table. When you're all about you, you end up lonely. But when you're about other people and their success and loving them, you end up with a full, a full table. Isn't that great? And so it was in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David, and, the, and a lad was with him. And then he said to his lad, now run, find the arrows which I shoot. So the little kid's watching the arrow. Jonathan is going to shoot the, uh, the arrows. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. It's part of the plan. And when the lad had come to the place where the arrow was, which Jonathan shot, Jonathan cried out at the lad and said, <coughs> is not the arrow beyond you? I mean, now he's not talking to the kid. He is. But who's he talking to? He's talking to David. In, 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 it's subtle, so no one else knows because David's a hunted man. So this is the way that they're communicating without being found out. And Jonathan's life is in danger too. The arrow's beyond you. 
And Jonathan cried out after the lad, Make haste, hurry, do not delay. So Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came back to his master. But the lad did not know anything. Couldn't take any chance on anybody else finding out that David was alive, or David was there and ratting him out. Only Jonathan and David knew of the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to, this, to his lad, his bow and arrow, and said to him, go, carry them to the city. Now what's that gonna do? What's that gonna leave? That is gonna leave David and Jonathan alone together to say goodbye. Because we know what Saul is planning. So as soon as the lad had gone, verse 41, David arose from a place toward the south, fell on his face to the ground, and bowed down three times. This is David doing this. The king, the, the king to be. And they kissed one another. Now don't, you know, again, you read, people read that stuff, they go, see, we told you. This is Middle Eastern culture. This is, you know, still to this day, sometimes we go like to, to Nepal, other countries around the world. You watch the young boys uh, and the young girls. The young boys will walk down the street holding hands. And Americans come and go, whoa. That's weird. That's, that's really weird. What are they, you know, are they homosexual? What's going on there? And uh, it's like, well, no, that's just their culture. They have a culture of friendship that doesn't have a problem with young boys holding hands together. It's their culture. Our culture is different. We have a more isolated kind of culture, a, a less uh, affectionate kind of culture. But that's very common. So again, don't get, you know, weirded out by the fact that they kiss one another. When you travel and you meet uh, men and women that live in other cultures, there's a lot more of affection. We were talking about the, uh, the, this New Zealand tribe, the Maori people. I forget where, who I was having this conversation with. The Maori men, when the Maori men greet one another, do you know what they do? They touch foreheads together. And they look right into each other's eyes. Was it you, was, was it you Bill, was telling me about that? No, it wasn't you? I forget who was telling me about that. You can look it up, Google it. But they, they lock foreheads. And it's, try, try doing that with an enemy, right? With someone who you're, you're not close with. But that's how they, they make sure that, hey, we're, we're close here. You know, we're really close here. Uh, like a mint, you know? <laughs> so they kissed one another and they wept together. Because if you get weirded out by that, then you lose the, the beauty of the scene. They wept together, but David more so. I mean, David had more to, he, he's now going to be uh, on the run Jonathan's going to go back home. He's still got his home, and David's going to be out. I mean, he's lost his home, lost his family. He's lost everything. And you might think, well, what, what kind of God lets David go through that? This is, this is how God treats his next king? Well, David's in, in the school of faith. David's in the school of character building. David is going to learn that he can survive with no one but God. And sometimes that's a lesson we need to learn. Sometimes that's a lesson. Well, God, why are you doing this to me? Why am I here? Why, why, is, why have I been betrayed? Why are these people against me? Hey, there's a character process going on. It's the potter and the wheel, and there's a squeezing that's a shaping going on. You need to know that, <laughs> and you'll never know that I'm all you need until I'm all you have. And that's what David is going to learn. And he's going to, this is a tough, some tough chapters coming up with David. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace, since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, may the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Maybe you're familiar with the Alfred Lord Tennyson, who said it was better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And that maybe is used in romantic love, but you know, I think that's relational love. I think that uh, there's a time for us as Americans, as human beings, as Christians especially, to say, you know what, I have to invest some time in building at least a few close friendships. And that means I'm going to have to make some choices with my time. It means I'm going to have to make some choices to instead of sitting home and watching a movie by myself, I'm going to have to do it with somebody else. And for guys, it may be, you know, instead of saying, well, I don't go, I don't do retreats. So the guys that came on, there were some first-time guys that came on the retreat this year who were blown away, had a great time. Men's prayer, Saturday morning, great friendships. 
built in these kind of places. But that's a choice, right? Saturday morning, I have a choice. I can sleep in. I can watch TV. I can cut the grass or whatever else. No, not now, of course. But, uh, you know, there's all kind of, everything in life is a choice. You've got time. You have a certain amount of time. And I would, it would behoove us greatly to say I'm going to give some of that time instead of to giving it to myself to do selfish things, I'm going to do something that fosters not just serving the Lord, but serving the Lord with an eye to building relationships with another human being and watching, what that, watching the richness that builds in your life. That's how God said it's not good that man should be alone. And that's true. It's still true, isn't it? It's not good. And for some people, marriage fills that bill. And I think friendship is part of that too. Some attempt to avoid relationships because they want to avoid pain. Some sabotage every relationship they have. Some have been hurt, and some have lost. And the last point about friendship is that it involves loss. So if you never want to experience pain, you'll also never experience love. If you never want to be hurt, then you'll never get close to anybody. And you'll never enjoy the heights of friendship love, the heights of closeness, the heights of battling together. Because, you know, people move. I can name a number of guys I know that, uh, one or two especially, that have, I've been close to and they've moved away. Uh, we just had to say goodbye to Denny. Uh, Denny moved out west and that was hard. I love Denny. Guy ministered to a lot of young men in this church. It's hard to say goodbye. Uh, people die. It happens. And in Jonathan and David's case, this will be the last time they see each other. Bar one time in chapter 23, David uh, is going to be in hiding. Jonathan is going to come to him, and he's going to encourage him in his faith. And he's going to say, hey, look, look, David, don't be freaked out. I'm still with you. You're still going to be the king. And when you rule, I'm going to be on your side. Stay strong, my friend. I love that. Chapter 23, verse 16. But that's the last time they'll see each other, and only briefly, and then Jonathan will be killed in battle, and David will mourn and grieve over his friend. We have a wonderful reunion to look forward to in heaven, don't we? There's a lot of friendships, a lot of oneness that will be rediscovered there in heaven. But for, all, for, all, for earthly purposes, yeah, it's going to be some risk. But I would say that uh, it's well worth it. Amen, church? All right, let's pray. Lord, as we close out this uh, just intriguing chapter and watching just the lives of two men that uh, foster a faith-filled, courageous friendship together uh, to, for one man to love another man as his own soul, Lord. I pray that the men in this room and the women would have that sort of closeness to somebody. Lord, I pray for this next year to be a year with the, all the fullness of uh, relationship health that comes from knowing you and being your children. So Lord, thank you for this chapter, for these men. We long to meet them in the heavenly reunion and we're thankful for the uh, lives that they lived out in the open for all of us to learn from. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Go in peace.